Welcome to the general chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 51 to 55. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 51, 52, 53, 54, and 55. And now let's go through the questions together. In question 51, we're asked which of the following influences a chemical reaction to become spontaneous? So what influences a chemical reaction to become spontaneous? So some of these will make it more likely to be a spontaneous reaction, whereas others won't, or they might have the opposite effect. So option A is seeing reactants having a lower free energy than products. Okay, what you need to keep in mind for free energy, let's say we put delta G over here, and then this is just the reaction progress. So what we want to see is this. We have the reactants at the beginning, and then we have the products down there at the bottom. And then there is this difference between them, this delta G, this difference in free energy. What we want is for the products to have a lower free energy, so that overall when we have this difference in free energy, it's negative. The products is lower than that of the reactants, and every system tends to go towards lower free energy. If it was going spontaneously, it would go towards lower free energy, be more stable. In option A, we're saying reactants have lower free energy than the product. So that would actually be if we were starting out over here and then going up backwards. If we were going backwards in this given reaction, that would be a non-spontaneous reaction, not a spontaneous one. So reactants should have higher free energy. Option B is saying reactants being more ordered than the products. This one does make sense. If reactants are more ordered than the products, that means that the products are more disordered. And if you tend towards more disorder, you are increasing in entropy, and a high entropy is something which will lead to a more spontaneous reaction. KEQ is less than one, and option C, that one would not lead to something being spontaneous, because remember, this KEQ, the equilibrium constant, is products over reactants. And so if this is less than one, that means that the denominator is a bigger number and we have more reactants. Therefore, at equilibrium, it didn't really go forward from reactants towards products, so this reaction didn't really move forward. Whereas if we had KEQ greater than one, that means we have more products than reactants, so the reaction went forward, so it's something which is spontaneous. So C is backwards than what it should be, so incorrect. And finally, option D is saying low reaction temperature. No, if we had a low reaction temperature, if anything, that would prevent the reaction from going forward and being spontaneous, whereas it otherwise might have been spontaneous at room temperature. And if we want to make a reaction more spontaneous, we would likely increase the temperature rather than decreasing it. So all of these will lead to a reaction becoming more non-spontaneous, and only option B will lead to a reaction becoming more spontaneous. In question 52, it says two volatile liquids, A and B, are combined as a solution in a closed beaker. There are three moles of liquid A and nine moles of liquid B. The vapor pressure of liquid A is 10 millimeters of mercury and that of liquid B is 20. Which of the following is the correct vapor pressure of the solution? So we have two liquids. We have A, which has three moles in the final solution, and we have B, for which we have nine moles. A, 10 millimeters of mercury is its vapor pressure, and then B has this vapor pressure. And then we want to know vapor pressure of the solution. So for this, we can just use route saw. And what that tells us is if we take the pure vapor pressure of whatever solvent or solution we're talking about, whatever the solvent we're talking about actually, or liquid, and then we just take its mole fraction in a solution, that's how much it's contributing to the final vapor. And since we had three moles plus we had nine moles, we have in total 12 moles of solution. So we have three over 12, which is the same thing as one fourth times 10 millimeters of mercury. And we just have to add the other one, which is now nine twelfths or three fourths times 20. 
when we do this calculation, we see that that equals to 17.5 millimeters of mercury. So our correct answer is B. And remember, we used Routes Law for this. In question 53, we're asked which of the following can be used as a half cell in an, an, an electrochemical cell along with having copper. So we want to have another half cell. We want to have some electrochemical reaction with this cell. So the one cell we have is copper and then it's ion. And you have three cells given to you and you have the reduction potential given. So for the reduction potential, you just have to keep in mind that if there's a difference in the reduction potential between two half cells, then electrons are going to start flowing. You're going to have reduction reaction in one and the oxidation reaction in another. So that means option one and three are good. Option two, it has the same setup. So it has you know the same element within the half cell and therefore the same reduction potential. So if you have these two connected, then there isn't going to be a redox reaction taking place. However, if you have different concentrations in the two half cells, then based on this concentration gradient, you're gonna have the transfer of electrons and ions as a result. So it can be based on concentration or based on this reduction potential. So you can also, if we had different concentrations, have a setup with option two. So technically you can have one with all three of them. In question 54, it says hydrogen bonds can be considered a form of blank. So hydrogen bonds, they can be a form of one of these other types of interactions. And so if we have water, which looks like this, you'll know that the oxygen is delta negative, the hydrogens are delta positive. So there's a dipole within this molecule. And then if we were to have another water molecule come along, because you have delta negative on the oxygen and delta positive on the hydrogens, this oxygen on the right, sorry about that, one second, the oxygen on the right is attracted to this delta positive hydrogen on the left. So the oxygens in different water molecules are attracted, attracted to the hydrogens in others, and they form this kind of bond. You'll notice that there's a solid line between the water molecules the main oxygen and the two hydrogens it's connected to because those are covalent bonds but dashed lines between the hydrogen bond between the two different water molecules and that's because it's not really like a a full bond that's formed it's more of a transient bond that's formed because of these charges and if you have something delta negative coming along and reacting with this delta positive this hydrogen and it's pulling away even more electron density as a result, it's making it even more delta positive, and then it can go forth and have even more hydrogen bonding interactions with other mo water molecules in the solution. So you can think of a hydrogen bond as being kind of in between a dipole, dipole interaction and an ionic bond, but if you were to ever be asked which type of interaction is it, you'd say A. It's a specialized type of dipole-dipole interaction. It exists because of these dipoles that occur when you have hydrogen bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. And so it's based entirely on those dipole-dipole interactions. It's not an ionic bond because it's not due to actual formal charges, but in terms of like strength, it is stronger than a typical dipole-dipole bond and you know less strong than an ionic bond. So the strength lies between these two bonds. Like I said, it's not a covalent bond. Otherwise you'd see that, dash, that solid line instead of the dashed. So it's based on these charges once again and it's, it's more transient than an actual full bond that's formed between that new oxygen coming in and reacting with the hydrogen. And it's not a van der Waals force either. This is the weakest type, which is based on, it can be based on molecules which don't have an otherwise dipole that you see in a dipole-dipole interaction. It's more of a very small transient dipole that exists all the time because of the repulsion between electrons and protons. But that's like the weakest type of interaction. It's not what hydrogen bonds fall under. In question 55, it says a reaction is as follows. So we have three moles of something going forth and then at the at product side, we have five moles or something. So keep in mind the moles, that's the most important part, where X is a particular atom. This reaction reaches equilibrium in particular conditions within a closed container. What would happen if the volume of the container were to suddenly be increased? So we have a reaction reaches equilibrium, it's in a closed container, and now the volume has been increased. 
So what would happen? So think about this according to Le Chatelier's principle. I usually think about it in terms of pressure. I know that if I have a system and pressure is increased, it goes to the side with the fewer moles because you have more pressure, you have things bouncing around, and you wanna to go to the side where you have less moles of something because then you have less things bouncing around and that kind of alleviates the stress in the equilibrium and that's what Le Chatelier's principle is about, alleviating the stress going to whichever side of the equilibrium makes for a less stressful situation. So in this case, we're talking about volume. Volume is increased. You should know that pressure is the opposite of volume so if in volume increases, pressure is inversely related. So pressure is going to go down. So instead of going to the right, where it would go if there were increased pressure, this is going to go to the left. When pressure has decreased or when volume has increased, you have a system which has expanded, right? And therefore, if it's expanded, there's more area or more volume for these the moles of whatever we're talking about to move into. There's more space for them to go. And there's lower pressure so you can actually you kind of want to try to increase the pressure and have more things bouncing around and bouncing against the walls so you have like a lower stress situation so you want to go towards where there are sorry not to the right but to the left you want to go where there are more moles so once again if you have high pressure you want to go where you have fewer moles to alleviate the pressure in this case we have low pressure so you want to go to the other side you can take up more pressure you can take up more moles of something so we're going to the right where we have more moles so option a is correct reaction goes towards the products b is incorrect that would happen in the opposite situation c is saying the reaction will stay in equilibrium no if we change the volume or the pressure then according to lachitelli's principle the equilibrium not is not going to just stay the same if it can it's going to move to a side in which there's either more or fewer moles. And D is incorrect. It's saying knowledge of temperature and pressure of the system would be required to assess the change in equilibrium. No, you don't have to know like too much specifics about the reaction or the specific pressure or temperature or volume. Like you don't have to know too many specifics as long as you know about either pressure and then therefore you also know about volume. As long as you know about one of those, you can already determine that based on how many moles of reactants and products you have. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here as well as in the description. And we have lectures given by students who have performed in a 99th percentile on the MCAT. And we offer things such as a customized MCAT study schedule and lecture videos as well. Make sure to check out our website to see everything else we offer. Here are some reviews of our course. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.